Okay. So, um, so, hello and welcome to Dr. Christy Turner's talk on chemical education as part of our Meet Academics event hosted by UOM ChemSoc and Chemistry Pass. So Dr. Christy Turner will be giving a short presentation followed by a question and answer session. So if you have any questions, please write them in the chat and one of us will read them out for you. And feel free to add the questions at any time, but please don't spam the chat so we can focus on the speaker. This session will be recorded and the talk will be posted online at a later date. We will do our best to ensure only the speaker is visible in the video that is published and we will discard of anything else. Please ensure your audio is muted and we would recommend turning your video off, not including your full name if you are uncomfortable or if you are under 18. And uh, last, uh, a number of people have actually asked about receiving a certificate for, of participation for this talk. So if you wish, you can submit a short piece of work summarizing the talk and bringing up their key ideas. Uh, please refer to your reminder email for more information and a sign up link. This will be only open to school students only. So it will be up to A levels or equivalent and those who haven't entered university yet. So that ends mine and over to you, Dr. Christy Turner. I think you're on mute. Um. Sorry, for some okay. reason I couldn't see all the options that I could do. Uh, welcome, this is a bit strange. Um, <laughs> so we'll just see how we get on with this. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to um, to all the past leaders and um, ChemSoc at UOM for the opportunity to talk to everybody. Um, I think as somebody who's in chemistry education, perhaps um, people tend to think that they know a lot about what we do, those of us that are in chemistry education rather than the kind of research focused academics. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what I have in terms of a braided career, which might be quite interesting to those of you who are considering what you're going to do when you graduate later on. So, Oh, come on, computer. This is what I do at the moment. So I have, for the last five years, I've worked three days a week in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Manchester as a teaching and scholarship lecturer with an interest in organic chemistry. And two days a week teaching in a school, which is Bolton School Boys Division, which is there on the right. Um, now, I am a qualified teacher. I've been a qualified teacher for nearly 15 years. Um, and this is a job that I essentially designed. Um, there's nobody else in the country that's doing this at the moment. Um, and really it's because my interest will how students moved from sixth form or um, college into uh, higher education in chemistry uh, and that transition process, um, which was what I was quite interested in. So yeah, just over about six years ago now, I proposed this role where I would work in both places. Um, and it seems to be working quite well since I'm still here five years later, having taken kind of a whole lot of personal duties at Manchester through, which has been fantastic. So I'll talk a little bit about how I ended up here. Um, so I very took a very traditional route. I'm one of those people who did everything in the right order, did my A-levels, did my degree, went under the PhD. Um, very traditional synthetic organic chemistry, stirring flasks, lots of column chromatography. Um, that PhD was sponsored by Pfizer, so I had to spend some time in industry because of that. Um, so that a fairly traditional academic route through. Um, I found myself at the end of that a little disillusioned with lab-based research, um, and I really liked communicating chemistry. I'd done quite a lot of outreach actually. Um, when so my PhD supervisor David, he had moved from the University of Glasgow to the University of Manchester during my PhD, which was um, somewhat troublesome. Um, and in that final year of my PhD, when I was in Manchester, I got involved in outreach and found that I really liked working with young people um, and really liked talking to them about chemistry. So decided then that I was going to train as a teacher rather than go down the research route. Um, so I did teach training um, at a very ordinary community comprehensive school um, just outside Manchester. Um, then very quickly um, kind of moved up the ladder as head of chemistry had a bit of time as a acting head of science and assistant head teacher um, but um, as part of me thinks sometimes maybe I've got a bit of ADHD here that I do get um, a little bit bored in my roles at times um, so I, I was getting a little bit disillusioned 
with the way teaching was going. I was climbing this ladder towards management. I was getting more responsibility and more money and all those things that people think that they want. But what I found was that it actually disconnected me with why I'd gone into teaching in the first place, which was essentially because I really loved chemistry and really loved talking. Um, and I was doing less teaching and I was doing more managing. I was spending more time tracking student progress in spreadsheets. Um, and I became a little bit disillusioned. Um, and I saw a role that was advertised by the Royal Society of Chemistry, um, which would take me out of school for a year and put me in a university um, to do a particular project. Uh, and that's what I did. I applied for that role and got it. Spent the year at the University of Manchester, um, working full time on transition issues. I, I did various things during that year. I then returned back to teaching. I got rid of all my responsibility, joined a different school um, and just went back as just a teacher, um, teacher of chemistry and biology in this case. Um, and enjoyed that. My daughter was young, it, you know, I, I turn up and teach. It, it was refreshing to have no responsibility and just get back to why I'd originally gone into teaching in the first place. Um, and then again, I started to feel like I'd really like to do both. I'd really enjoyed the time at Manchester in 2011 and thought, oh, I wonder if I could do both. And so I sent an email to a couple of people to see whether this would be a possibility. Um, and I don't know if anybody's ever sent an email where you don't look at the screen when you finally send it because you're so kind of scared of what the response would be. So um, the head of the School of Chemistry at that time was Professor Richard Wimpany. And um, he's quite a formidable character, as some of you at UOM will know. And I sent him this email, which is entirely speculative. Would you, would you employ me in this position? Um, and 20 minutes later, I got a reply that said, let's have a chat about this. This seems really interesting. Um, and that's where I am now, um, having essentially written my own job description and proposed my own job. So that's quite interesting. Uh, right. OK, I talked to you a little bit about portfolio and braided careers. So essentially what I've got is two strands of a role that both support each other. Um, so I'm not working full time in any role. Um, I'm working part time in two roles, really. Um, but they do complement each other. And what I do in one role does help me in the other role as well. And I think sometimes when you're younger, you do think you're going to get a job and you're going to climb a ladder and you can get more money, you get a mortgage and everything else. Um, when in reality, life is a lot more complicated than that. And you will probably go around in circles and and backtrack and things like that, which is exactly what I did. Um, and I think it, it's good to be open minded about what your path to success will be. You know, I'm currently in a job that I absolutely love. But if you'd asked me 15 years ago, I would probably have said I would be a deputy head teacher by now or something like that. So this this some buzzwords around this. You've got a kind of portfolio career and a braided career. Um, a portfolio career is where you've got several um, part-time roles, but they don't necessarily um, complement each other. So I don't know, you could be a musician and a teacher or something, or a um, you know, musician and a chemistry teacher, which doesn't necessarily move together. And I actually do have a friend who does that. Um, or you could have several of those roles. Um, so if you can kind of Google what a portfolio career is. What I have is a braided career. There are several strands to what I do and they all complement each other and help each other, which builds my skill set completely. It can be quite difficult to manage two fairly big part-time roles and then everything else on top. But I'll, sh I'll show you some of the other things that I do. So the other aspects of my braided career, um, I write a lot of resources. Uh, so the kind of materials that teachers would use in classrooms or university educators would use in classrooms. I do a lot of work in science communication, so that it can be on stage stuff, science festivals and things, um, TV work, uh, Country File News Round, Blue Peter, um, there's a TV programme called Back in Time for School that I was on. Um, I am a writer. I write an awful lot for education and chemistry, but also for chemistry world and for nature. Um, and those of you that have been at UOM will know that that now feeds into what I teach at UOM as well. Um, I'm a curriculum designer, so there are countries around the world now that do chemistry curriculums in the 16 to 18 year olds, and they do chemistry curriculum that's designed by me. That's a really strange um, kind of feeling. I've just finished a really big curriculum review for somewhere in the Middle East. Um, I examine, 
for public exam board. Um, so I have to mark every summer, turn up and mark all those, although not this summer, as you'll know. Uh, I'm a mentor. I mentor new teachers and people who are considering going into teaching to help them to be better teachers and um, help them build the resilience to, to kind of cope with the job. I also do a bit of policy work and advisory work for people like the RSC. So um, sometimes when the government wants people's opinions on aspects of chemistry education, science education or education in general, they will put a call out to organisations like the RSC or the Royal Society and, and people like that. And I will work with them to build a response. At the moment, I'm a fairly big curriculum project with them about rewriting the chemistry curriculum, excuse me, prior to um, a curriculum change, probably in about three years time. Um, and within this, I'm also a chemistry education researcher, which is much more linked to what I do at UOM. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit about that as well. So my research in chemistry education, my interests really are transition between high school and college and undergraduate study in chemistry, which um, feeds into obviously the job that I do at UOM. Um, what people might consider to be soft skills, so those kind of communication skills, writing skills, um, making people much more able to sell what, what they do. Um, that also includes pastoral care of students at university as well. Um, very interested in study skills and how students become more efficient in learning. Uh, just do some work on the use of models in chemistry education and the understanding of that. That's that kind of thing where um, maybe when you were younger and you learned about something in chemistry and then you moved on to the next step and you, then you felt that the teacher had lied to you because the next step got more complicated. Um, and that's all to do with the use of models um, and how you use a model that is appropriate for the level of students that you're teaching. Um, and the other one is on balancing equations, uh, which is where I've got a fairly big project at the moment. Um, and my fourth year student did quite a lot of work on that last year. And hopefully this coming up academic year will be the one where I start to generate some papers in that. So I'll give you a few research snippets so you can see what chemistry education research is like as opposed to chemistry research. Um, on the transition issue, um, I have a chapter in a book here which is called Teaching Chemistry in Higher Education um, which has become a little bit of a, a bible for people who do teach um, chemistry in HE uh, which is about looking at why how school is different to university and what we can do on both sides it isn't just about the university changing what they do in order to better fit in with the school um, it is for school teachers as well and um, people in charge of, of sixth forms and colleges to think about how they're best setting up their students for um, a good transfer to higher education so there, were, there are a few broad themes in this. I was, I was talking about this last week at a um, conference about student support. Um, the main four themes are to do with the background factors that anybody has. Um, so there are certain factors that we know make a transition to university more difficult. Uh, there is a class and cohort connectedness. And this is going to be a particular challenge around the incoming cohort after COVID-19 um, because those of you who are at university or even if you're at school you'll know that you have friends um, and you hopefully feel a connection to the people that you learn with and building that is really important to students making a strong transition to undergraduate study and um, those students who feel isolated who don't have peers who they get along with who don't have academics who know their names they're much less likely to make a good transition and to be successful um, there are aspects of curriculum and assessment um, the curriculum at university is far more flexible than the curriculum at school and college. Um, so is the assessment. Um, and coursework has been going out of favour within school curriculum, but actually is becoming more of a feature of university education. Um, and then there's teaching, learning and feedback where you will, those of you at university will know that you get lots of different types of classes. There are lectures and workshops and labs and tutorials and, and all kinds of different sizes of classes and things like that different modes um, really schools exist on that routine of you know one hour lessons turn up teach teach 
teaches you and you, and you go away. So there are some quite different, quite big differences there. And especially with feedback where actually you get loads of feedback at school, your teacher's constantly questioning you and ask, and seeing how you're doing and writing stuff on your work. And you don't so much get that at university. So that's what's in that book chapter. Um, just recently, as in should be out actually today, um, done a paper on transition post this COVID-19 disruption. Um, and one of the things we looked at was subject knowledge after the COVID issue. So um, many of you will know that schools closed in March in the UK and Ireland, and the exams were cancelled pretty quickly after that, um, which meant that the extrinsic motivation provided by an exam was gone. Um, so students had no real reason to study. Um, even if they were going to university because their grades, it, it made no difference to their grades. Um, so we have students who will start university this September who potentially may not have studied for six months. So we did a literature survey and some work, some uh, surveys with teachers to find out what they thought about this. Um, and this is just a quick one slide summary of this. Um, so essentially we know that forgetting is natural. We know that the longer time since something, something has been learned is important. So this six months is gonna be an issue. The loss of those exams is absolutely crucial. Um, we already know that learning loss happens. We know it happens over the summer. There's loads of research on that. Um, Cooper's 1996 paper tells us a lot about learning loss over the summer and it tends to be greater for mathematical, computational and procedural areas, whereas conceptual understanding seems to be reasonably secure. Um, most teachers think there will be deficiencies this, this autumn. They think that's due to exam cancellations um, and they actually highlighted synthetic organic transformations to be the most affected this year, um, followed by your kind of core physical chemistry like kinetics and thermodynamics. And teachers favoured us taking a holistic approach to intervention. So putting some additional formative assessment in, some small group teaching and that kind of thing. Um, so that was quite interesting. They didn't want us to just stick a big course before the students arrive and expect them to have caught up. Uh, modelling. Um, quite interested in the use of models in the classroom. This is, is if you've ever been in my office, those of you that are at UOM, you'll see these things hanging around. Um, we were looking at covalent bonding and modelling that with a hands-on approach um, to help stimulate conversations in students. So that's a, a paper in JKM Ed. Uh, study skills. Um, my fourth year student, not this year, just finished, but the year before, Holly Chung, um, we worked on reading and we were looking at what students read. Um, we looked at students from pre-application through to year four and also what academics thought students should be reading. Um, so we did a kind of mirrored survey of both of them. Uh, so this shows you how often people were reading journals and textbooks. There was, what we found essentially was there, there was a really, really big range um, and that actually textbooks were not being used as much as we thought they were. Um, interesting to see how that matches with academics' expectations. Um, most academics thought that students don't do enough reading um, and that they really thought students should be reading, but they were complete, they were, yeah, they didn't match up at all. Essentially, um, academics completely overestimated how much reading students should be doing. So students using textbooks less frequently than we expect them to. They're actually reading journals far earlier and with greater frequency than academics expect. Um, so most of the academics who are not engaged in teaching much in the early years probably don't realise how much students begin to read journals earlier on. Um, we also looked at ebooks um, and because most universities are going towards ebooks because they take up less space, they need less staff, lots and lots of reasons for that. Um, and basically, we found that there was a, a kind of conflict in what students think about ebooks. So they tend to prefer printed books, but they also know that for lots of reasons, ebooks are more convenient. Um, they're searchable and that kind of thing. So the, this cognitive conflict that we've got between the use of ebooks and the use of printed books is interesting. Um, and it's something we're going to work on as we move to a more digital model. Um, and also potentially when we move to hybrid teaching in the autumn because of COVID. Um, so we found from this that if we just tell them in induction how to read or to read, they don't do it. Um, we're not entirely sure how well 
most academic colleagues understand how students reading changes and that ebooks aren't um, really revolutionizing revolution revolutionizing is that really a word um, <laughs> for our students so we need greater guidance for students on the use of ebooks and how they could be advent advantageous to their study um, so that's in JK Med as well that came out earlier this year yeah, it's actually got quite a lot of traction and being really, really quite popular with the chemistry education community I'll quickly go into balancing equations um, quite a lot of questions that we've got around the balance of equations um, those of you that are at school or if you remember your time at school remember that balancing equations is one of those um, topics that it can be quite tricky for some students maybe some of your um, colleagues when you were at school you remember them finding this really difficult um, so we've got lots of questions that we might like to answer about balancing equations because it's something that really frustrates teachers um, we quickly did a quick survey on whether students lost this i'm quite interested in this learning loss idea and we actually found that there was very little learning loss over the summer so students they were, these were year eight students who had been taught how to balance equations that year they had got the same roughly the same score um, i did a lot of different statistics on it to see whether there was anything behind it and essentially over a kind of eight week break they generally stayed the same so there wasn't any learning loss over the summer um, we also looked at a correlation with ability. So this, on this graph, on the X axis, you've got something called the Midyear score. That's like a cognitive test, a bit like an IQ test, but a little bit more um, complicated than that. So that gives a score from 50 to 150. Um, so everybody above 100 would be in the top 50% of the population as far as um, cognitive ability is concerned. So you can see that most of my sample is above 100, which you'd probably expect from people who were doing um, chemistry rather than like double science or something. Um, so the blue dots there, the year eight students, and the red dot and the orange dots there, the year nine students. And on the y-axis, you can see this is the score on this standardised test that we're giving them. So you can see that you've got. Um, it does look roughly like there's a correlation between their cognitive abilities measured by that test and how well they score on their equations. But it also shows that more year nines do better than year eights. Now those year nines were taught how to do it in year eight. So actually just by general good teaching, they've all managed to get better at balancing equations as well. Not without, it doesn't need any kind of specific intervention. Right, that's the end of that. I have I've given you lots and lots of different um, things to think about there. Uh, what I'll say about chemistry education as, as an area, it has the potential to give you a really, really varied career if you want it to. Um, you know, I've been really been able to follow my interests in what I do. Um, and it, it's a fantastic role to be in. Um, students, it, it's an immense privilege to spend a particular time with students when they're developing in their chemistry education um, and maturing into um, even school students through to graduates. So um, I would certainly recommend it if you are someone who potentially re is a little bit like me, really likes chemistry, really likes talking and really likes communicating. Um, careers in science communication are really, really, really attractive. However, they do tend to be in the gig economy and they are quite um, tenuous, short term contracts, um, freelance, that kind of thing. Uh, whereas in reality, the ultimate science communications science communicators are teachers and lecturers who are doing this day in day out with young people so i will take any questions i don't know who's in charge of questions hello uh, thank you for that uh, the first question is just somebody asked uh, how would you keep students motivated during the lockdown uh, yeah thank you yeah so that's been really interesting with the with the lockdown um university students has we were mostly finished when lockdown happened so it hasn't been quite as much of an issue and um, we only had a few weeks left so university students in terms of motivation that wasn't so much of a problem except again for many of them their exams were cancelled so that made it, it quite difficult to for certain sections of them um, for school students the easiest way to keep them motivated is to give them a very strong structure um, so an expectation that they've going to do things at particular times tasks to tick off um, and it is difficult because I think as an education system we've moved so much to the teacher being some kind of external motivator and what we want to do as students get older is to change that motivation to be more intrinsic um, and that they do these things not because I'm asking them to 
or because they have to, but because they want to. Um, so I do think perhaps the UK and Irish education system has moved too much towards the teacher being the person who makes you do things rather than you do it because you know it's going to make you better at a subject. Um, so it's been very, very difficult. Um, but certainly when I've been school teaching, I've been teaching synchronously. So um, when my timetable, I would start a lesson off at that time. It could be through Zoom. Not all of them were through Zoom, um, but they would get an email at the time the lesson would start and start their work and that kind of thing. And certainly in the university in September, there'll be a mix of synchronous and asynchronous in order to help students to motivate. You know, we've got to admit that um, and accept that people are new to this. They're not going to be perfect at this. I actually think if you put any of us as academics in the lockdown situation, we would have displayed the same learning behaviour as many of the students have. Thank you. you. Um, we've, we've got another question. Um, what are your thoughts on teaching A-level chemistry slash biology and um, what has made you stick with high school? Um, teaching A-level chemistry um, and biology, it, uh, it's, it's great. It, it's interesting. Um, I actually like teaching younger students as well. At the moment I teach um, year eight and nine and then year 12 and 13. Um, what's made me stick with teaching high school? Um, I do love it. The, it, it pe teenagers have got a really bad rep. Um, they are fantastic young people to be with. It gives me so much variety. I learn so much from the students as well. And yeah, I do think all the um, bad reputation that teenagers have got is actually a little bit unfounded, really. Um, because when you work with young people day in, day out, and you 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 see what they're trying to overcome, uh, what their kind of hopes and dreams are, then it, anything that they do that is negative, which it is because they are again learning their way in the world, um, learning how to behave in, in the world and that kind of thing, is somewhat mitigated by, by that. Um, so yeah, I think people did expect me to just jump to the other side into university teaching, um, but I'm really glad that I stayed in school as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, somebody here has asked, uh, for budding science journalists, would you suggest they get a double master's or a PhD? Um, it's tricky because it depends what area of science journalism you want to be in. Um, particularly areas that are medical tend to need you to have a PhD. Uh, most people who work in science writing that I know have got a BSc and an MCAM or an MCAM or something like that and a portfolio of work that they've done along the way. Um, so I would suggest if, if you are interested in that to start blogging, to um, get involved in student journalism on campus when you're at university um, and build up quite a lot of articles that you can share with someone when you're applying for jobs. So um, we do have a student at the moment who is going through the interview process for uh, an editor's job. And yeah, one of the tasks is to write an article. So you do need quite a lot of um, practice in that. But like I said, a lot of it is gig economy unless you get on a, on a particular um, magazine or newspaper. And I, I mean, we do need more science journalists as you probably realize from the COVID thing. Some of the stuff we're knocking around in the media at the moment has been pretty, pretty poor. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we've got another question for teaching. Um, how do you spark interest? Uh, how do you spark student interest in chemistry in terms of helping students to see how chemistry shapes the world around us? Um, that is, dare I say it, just good teaching. Um, you can get students to a certain extent, you can bring them along with you just by your own sheer enthusiasm. I've had students who were like, oh, it's all right, miss. We know that this isn't isn't really relevant but we like it because you like it and um, so if you are someone who really enjoys chemistry yourself that kind of energy can bring your students along with you as well there will always be subjects that or topics that we don't like teaching and I find it really really hard I, this year I find it really really hard to get any kind of enthusiasm for teaching how we clean water um, <laughs> because I just couldn't as important as that was it you know they the filtering and treatment and stuff it just wasn't exciting but mostly you you'll get them through your own kind of enthusiasm and yet and sharing um what's happening that's up to date so much of the science education curriculum is 
based a long time ago um, because it's fundamental. It's fundamentals that we're teaching. So if you can give them a little bit of a glimmer of what's modern, that's really useful. Okay, thank you. Somebody's asked, um, what do you think is the best way to fill gaps in learning uh, before September? Um, firstly, it's a little bit of diagnosis. It's to figure out where gaps are. So if you do have gaps, um, I think it can be quite hard sometimes to, if you were sitting here, you would have a few topics where you'd be like, oh, I know I'm not sure on that. Um, but there'll be other things where, you're, where you think you're okay, but actually if I was to put you in a test situation, you probably wouldn't be. Um, so a little bit of diagnosis, whether that's through just doing a few past papers, a few multiple choice questions and that kind of thing. Um, and then just sitting down with a bit of an introductory textbook or some YouTube videos or, or one of those like really popular web pages that are around like chem guide and chem revise and that kind of thing. Um, just, just to make it more secure, more than anything else. Um, but anything that you do um, is better than nothing. Thank you. Um, and we've got um, a question regarding science communication. Um, so for budding science journalists, uh, would you suggest they get a double master's, like a master's in uh, say chemistry and then science journalism, or would you suggest they get a PhD in chemistry? I think I, think I already asked that. I think I've already asked oh. it. Right, was that the one? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, sorry. Um, but what um, what advice would you give uh, chemists who want to say branch out into science journalism? And what are the career prospects like in that field? Um, the career prospects are pretty good, except there's a lot of competition for jobs. Um, so the a student of mine who's doing this at the moment, I think they said there was 140 applications for the role that he went for. And in the first round, they took that down to seven and now they've taken it down to three. Um, so there is quite a lot of competition. It's quite an attractive role for people. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily say, oh yes, throw yourself into becoming a science journalist because I'm, I'm not sure I would recommend it in terms of job prospects because there aren't as many jobs as people think there are, unless you are prepared to freelance. But if you're gonna freelance, then you have to think where is your regular income coming from? So, if you want to build up to that, I would always say get involved during your undergrad. Um, so publish things through your chemistry society, publish things through the student mags and that kind of thing. And you, you can pitch in magazines. If you've got something you want to write about, you can send a pitch. That doesn't necessarily mean you'll get commissioned, um, but you can just send a pitch in. You can approach someone like Chemistry World with a pitch about if there's something you're really passionate that you want to write about and a friend of mine who's a, an editor on chemistry world said if you've got something where you'd want to say rush into the pub and tell your friend about it then that's probably something you should write about thank you hello uh, somebody here has asked do you think chemistry as a subject should be taught differently at school or do you think it's okay the way it is um interesting Ooh. Hmm. do i think it should be taught differently um possibly depends where in the world you're from um because certainly the curriculum work that i've done has highlighted to me how different it is in different parts of the world in terms of the chemistry education experience that you get especially with regards to practical work actually um i think we do a decent job in the uk and ireland um my real concern in terms of science education and chemistry education is that particularly in England, we get very narrow very quickly. It's very, um, often you get students who come into university with only three A levels. And if you come in with say maths, chemistry and physics, you haven't done very much in the way of written communication. Um, so it can be quite challenging when you're expected to communicate your science when you've been out of that kind of practice. Um, so I, when I did my levels, I did biology, chemistry, history and French, which is a really strange combination. But certainly that additional time spent working with language has really helped me in, in terms of the science writing and the science education writing that I do. Um, so I, I would definitely advocate going more towards an IB kind of model where we do more subjects for longer. Um, and that would obviously mean that people had less chemistry when they came in. But I think we can always make that up. Um, it, so 
but roughly I, I do think the teaching approaches do roughly work to be honest um, and the issue we have with undergraduate numbers and I've written on the about this uh, for chemistry world in that we do have an issue with the pipeline of students coming through I actually think is more to do with some of the competing subjects we've got and how that's where we get many students who do chemistry a level because they want to be a medical doctor um, and they not necessarily because they want to be in science um, and they don't necessarily see how the work that chemists do um, or physicists or biologists is actually just as uh, important in terms of having good outcomes for patients that as anything that a doctor does um, they don't necessarily necessarily see the people who work behind the scenes in the pharmaceutical industry and that kind of thing they see the the medical doctor at the, the forefront of it Thank you for that. Uh, someone here has asked, uh, what do you think can be done about the gender imbalance amongst chemistry academics and do you think undergraduate teaching slash culture could change um, with regards to this? this is, yeah, this, I mean this is really really tricky. Um, so I am aware that I am one of not very, very many um, female academics that we've got at the University of Manchester and actually if you take out the two of us who are teaching focused as well, um, then that looks even worse when you're looking at people who are PIs. Um, I don't think Athena Swan has worked necessarily. I think Athena Swan has actually made it easier for male academics to um, fulfil their kind of child caring roles and that kind of thing. Um, what was interesting that was that the University of York a number of years ago um, actually took on almost blank as a blanket a whole group of female academics who were very young um, and started them out on research careers and then has continued to support them through flexible working, through maternity leave and that kind of thing. Um, I do wonder if we do need to go down a positive discrimination route and actually say if we're going to do this we're really going to chuck something into it and for a couple of years to prioritise um, females in those roles. Um, but I can't see it happening. So. <laughs> I, it is a real shame because actually we, we're, we're roughly 50-50 at A-level, um, we're roughly 50-50 at degree level, drops a bit when it comes to PhDs and then it just falls off a cliff edge. Um, and I, would, I was part of that issue as well. When I finished my PhD, I did not want to be an academic. Um, I saw that my, um, the hours that I put in during my PhD were ridiculous. The, cult, the research culture I found really, really difficult. Um, and yet somehow I ended up back here. Um, but I think they are turning it around. The RSC is putting a lot of pressure on as well. Um, but I, yeah, I think we do need to take more positive action. Thank you. Um, that was very insightful. Um, there's another question. Um, is there anything a chemistry teacher in the UK can do to make sure writing skills are good by university with only the scientific A-levels? that is set more of a project type homework or um, do you think this is too much pressure on students with homework already? Um, I, and this is something that we do in my school as well, I would always advocate sticking a project in there and getting them to write it up properly um, as a prompt um, for them to do that. We actually use the time between kind of the end of year 12 and the beginning of the year 13 to do this because we find it's a time that's very disrupted by students going out to open days and for us cricket matches and concerts and all the things that happen in the summer that disrupt the summer term um, so we actually have about three weeks where we have them do uh, an open-ended project and last year we gave them some oranges lemons and limes and asked them to find out how much vitamin c was in them by their own route so they had to investigate find out a particular method to do it then do it then write it up and about and excuse me evaluate it um, so yeah i think that's as good a route as any. Our biology um, department also have them do a literature review between year 12 and year 13 over the summer. They get access to a university library and they get asked to research a particular topic in biology. And I think if you're doing that across, if the student's doing a number of sciences, so say they were doing the chemistry project with us in chemistry and then in, they did biology and they did this literature review and maybe the maths department did something else. Actually between you, what you've done is, is made a bit of an impact. Um, but I think when we, you're working in isolation, it's always good to take a bigger picture of all the subjects that the students are taking. 
Thank you. Uh, somebody here with regards to the employment and journalism, uh, they've asked, uh, re recently they've been reading about how the industry is becoming saturated. And somebody else has also asked about how you cope with competition. Uh, so I think these two kind of go together. Yeah, I do think it's, I, is industry saturated? The, I think there's been a shift away from, so when I went to university, certainly, and I talked to my contemporaries, the expectation was that you would get a job in chemistry in a big company. And at the time it was places like ICI, it was Pfizer, and then it was AstraZeneca and places like that. Um, those companies are increasingly shifting out of the UK um, and moving operations overseas. So it depends how flexible you are in terms of your location. Um, but actually what they're also doing is contracting out to SMEs, small and medium sized enterprises. So increasingly the graduates now will be looking at getting jobs in those small to medium enterprises rather than in the big companies. And you'll still end up working for the likes of Pfizer or AstraZeneca. It'll just be through the smaller company that you work for. Um, so I think the days of the kind of graduate milk round and chemists applying for the, all the really big places, those places will still be there. Um, not, there won't be as many of them, but also to be prepared to cast your net wider and to look at SMEs and startups as well. There's an awful lot of innovation that's happening there. A lot of entrepreneurs that are starting up in this kind of area. Um, so to be more flexible with how you are applying for jobs and coping with competition, it is really hard because every time you get a knockback, it is disheartening. Um, but you have just got, you have kind of got to realize it isn't necessarily something that's wrong with you. If you're not getting those roles, it's about the market that you're in. Um, and as long as you ask for feedback and hopefully get it, then you can then use that to help yourself to perform better next time. But it is really hard because you do put your heart and soul into every application as you should, otherwise you've got much less chance of getting it. Um, so, but yeah, just be, just be prepared to cash in it wide, look at SMEs um, and startups and all, yeah, just take every bit of feedback that you can get. <laughs> Thank you, that was really helpful. Um, so I don't think we have any more questions at the moment. So, but we did have um, someone commenting here. They said that they recently read your article on how to teach electrolysis and they thought it was an excellent piece of work. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I think we're gonna hand it over to Dukula now to okay. wrap it up. Okay. Um... And minimize the zoom. So let me get this. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Christie, for your time. And thank you for everyone for coming along. So this room will be closed in closed after I finish this. But uh, before we go, let us remind you that uh, you can submit a piece of work summarizing this talk. So check your emails. Um, the sign up link for that is there. Uh, in, in the email and look out for more information and the recorded talks on the Chemsoc and past social media accounts. We will be publishing them uh, by this week, hopefully. Okay. So thank you very much, Dr. Turner. Uh, thank you. Thank you everybody for coming along as well. I'm going to end this meeting now. Bye.